Good morning, and welcome to worship on this blessed Reformation Sunday, on this Sunday when later today we um, affirm the baptism of 11 of our 10th graders, um, and hopefully we don't get snow. That's all across our fingers. Um, I'm happy to have all of you here today, um, you who are here in the sanctuary, you who are out there in the radio, and you who are in Facebook Live, wherever you are, we're so glad to have you worshiping with us today. A couple of quick announcements. Um, as you can see, church is inside today. It will be inside next week as well. Um, our response team, our COVID response team is meeting on Tuesday and we will make some decisions, um, just analyze kind of where we are and where things are in our community and we will make some announcements about what um, worship will look like and other activities as well um, going forward um, from there. So um, that will happen Tuesday and then we'll make the announcements later in the week. Um, as uh, I mentioned, our, we have our confirmation services later. Um, confirmation in the time of COVID looks a little different because of the number of people we want to have here blessing our confirmants. Um, we will have a service at 11 for the first six and we will have a service at 12.30 for the second five. Both those services will be on Facebook Live, so everybody can join in the celebration for our confirmation students. And I, shouldn't, I should stand aside. These are just some of the projects that um, the 11 of them have been working on. Um, they, actually, one student started last Easter, helping us put our Easter service together, and others have helped put the youth room together down at Trinity Center. And as you can see, we have faith statements and big projects, and um, it's just a blessing to have these kids um, just really affirm their faith in, in these ways. Next Sunday, as I mentioned, um, is All Saints Sunday, um, you know, due to restrictions. We can't kind of do it how we did, but like I said, the worship team came up with a wonderful idea of doing luminaries outside so that not just the Trinity folks, but everyone will be able to um, see the blessings and celebrate um, those we've lost over the last year and previously. Um, so uh, next Sunday between 5 and 7, you can come to church, light a candle for a luminary, and that candle will burn for six hours. So I hope to see the whole front of the church filled with candles. You can also put a red ribbon on the cross if you, if you want to. Um, we will have worship indoors in the morning um, and with communion and then drive through communion after. For those folks who aren't comfortable coming to worship in person, we'll have communion here, but then also drive through communion immediately after worship next Sunday. Um, if you are interested in sponsoring the radio broadcast, um, we don't have a particular sponsor today. We thank the, the, um, the radio broadcast fund, but if you are interested in doing that in the future and also the... Um, the candle for um, our missionary for a day candle, just call the office and um, let them know. And also we are in need of new communion linens and believe it or not, new communion linens cost about $500. So if anybody is interested in making a donation um, for that, um, we will um, look, you know, we're looking to raise a little money for communion linens as well. I don't think I have any other announcements. Does anybody else have any other announcements? Other than I want to thank the Handbell Choir um, very much. It's a blessing to have them here today. Um, normally we would all be singing triumphantly, um, and uh, today we have the Handbell Choir to fill in admirably, so give, we give thanks for them. So I think that's it. So let us all take a deep cleansing breath and breathe in the Spirit of God. And breathe out all our anxieties for the next 45 minutes. Worship begins with confession and forgiveness found on page two of your bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. 
We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together the prayer of the day found on the bottom of page two of your bulletin. Gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort us in times of trial. Defend us against all enemies of the gospel and bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, amen. So Psalm 46 um, is uh, one of the the sort of most famous psalms in the 150. Um, And Martin Luther loved this psalm so much that he wrote a hymn based on it. And it's the one that we often sing on Reformation Sunday. Um, And today, um, the Handbell Choir will be helping us read through. I'll read a few verses, and then they'll play a verse, and so on. So um, uh, Psalm 46 with special music. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam though the mountains tremble with its tumult. whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth.
God makes wars cease to the end. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Thank you, Handbell Choir and Jean. And I wish all of you could have seen what I see as Theodore is doing a little directing of his own. Definitely it's in the DNA. Our gospel for today is, comes from John's gospel, the eighth chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. Jesus speaks of truth and freedom as spiritual realities known through his word. He reveals the truth that sets people free from sin. Now listen to the gospel. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The, Jew the Pharisees and scribes answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks today for August, Haley, Allison, Caleb, Tyson, Hunter, Maggie, Madeline, Nathan, Lydia, and Ella, who affirm their baptism later today. Bless them, Lord, as you have blessed us. Guide them in your word and your ways. Remind them every day that you are here and you chose them to be yours. In your name we pray. Amen. This year, our confirmation students are learning about vocation, and specifically about Christian vocation. Um, the timing for this study couldn't be better. Um, we go in three-year cycles. We have um, the catechism, uh, Luther's catechism, small catechism one year. We talk about the Bible for a whole year, and then we talk about kind of Luther and the Reformation and vocation and what it means to have this tradition in our faith community. And so for the last two weeks in Confirmation, we've been specifically discussing the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther's role um, in that um, protest. It's been 503 years. I'm sure everybody remembers three years ago when we had the big celebration all across the Lutheran Church. Um, and it's been you know, three years since then, but 503 years since Luther stood on the steps of that cathedral and pounded those 95 theses into that door. And Luther was a priest, um, but let's you know, call him a pastor because he was most concerned about the role of the church in the lives of the people. So yes, he was a preacher, and yes, he was a theologian who studied scripture, but Luther's biggest concern was about how his people were affected by what was happening in the church, and that is a very pastoral role. So Luther was concerned, and honestly, concerned is really kind of too mild a word. Luther was anxious, he was worried, he was troubled, afraid, disturbed, alarmed about the state of the church. He was convinced, um, 
rightly, that the church leaders had become so corrupt that they had forgotten the meaning of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that good news is what we read in our gospel today. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now, we traditionally um, read this passage from John's Gospel on Reformation Sunday because it really is the crux of the gospel message. Um, interestingly, the word crux is, means cross. It's the cross. It's the part of the gospel message that was symbolized by Jesus' sacrifice. We know the truth that Jesus came into the world as one of us, suffered and died and was buried, and then surprisingly, unexpectedly, miraculously, astoundingly, Jesus was resurrected. The idea that anybody could be a slave to sin is a scandalous message to the scribes and Pharisees and Jewish leaders to whom Jesus is speaking in the eighth chapter of John's Gospel. Their jobs depend on folks abiding by strict laws and atoning for those laws in very specific ways, making sacrifices. The scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus' time honestly are not that much different than the church leaders in Luther's time. The scribes and the Pharisees' jobs depended on keeping the Romans who controlled Israel happy, and the Romans need lots of money to run their operations. The church leaders in Jesus' time or in Luther's time need the same stuff to keep the Pope and the princes happy, and they too need lots of money to run their operations. In both of those times, 1,500 years apart, it was the people who suffered. In both times, it was the people who felt like their sins were weighing them down. They felt like they could never be free of their sins, and they were bled dry of all of their money by the authorities. Now, going back in John's Gospel a little ways, uh, it begins with a story that most of us know pretty well. Jesus is teaching in the temple when the scribes and the Pharisees bring to them, bring to Jesus, a woman who was caught in adultery. Now, this is, you know, this is going to be a test for Jesus. What's he going to say? The law of Moses, as Jesus surely knows, demands that the woman who was caught in adultery be stoned to death for this sin. But Jesus confounds those accusers. Let anyone among you who is without sin cast the first stone, he says. And no one responds. How could they? Not one of these accusers dares pretend he is not a sinner. And they leave quietly, one by one, until all that's left is Jesus and the woman. And Jesus sends her on her way, forgiven, free from condemnation. For the scribes and the Pharisees, this was just one more example of why Jesus has to die. By the time we get to verse 31 of John's Gospel, they are fed up. And then Jesus throws out the ultimate insult. He tells them that the truth will make them free. Now, I'm sure, again, that many of you remember your Sunday school lessons. God made specific promises to Abraham that God would look after all of Abraham's descendants, giving them a promised land. But before that could happen, they all end up in Egypt. Remember the Pharaoh and Joseph and, you know, remember let my people go from the book of Exodus in the Old Testament. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt. For several hundred years, they worked for their masters until finally God sent Moses to lead them out of Egypt and into the Promised Land, and they would be slaves no longer. Fast forward 1,500 or so years, and the Exodus story is at the heart of Jewish identity. In fact, Jesus is preaching during the very festival, the Festival of Tabernacles, they called it, when the Jews celebrated God's providence to them during the 40 years that they were wandering around in the wilderness. How dare Jesus call them slaves? They are not slaves. And when Jesus tells them they have to know a particular truth in order to be free, that is the ultimate insult for the scribes and the Pharisees. They're pretty upset. And from then on, they plan for Jesus to be taken away and tortured and killed. Now, the word believe appears more than 100 times in John's gospel. I mean, John really wanted his readers to understand that Jesus is the real deal. 
Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, as he says later in chapter 14 of John's Gospel. And later, as Jesus is standing before Pilate, Pilate asks him, what is truth? And Jesus doesn't answer him, because the truth is right in front of Pilate. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the life. Now, every Sunday, as we did this Sunday, one of the first things we do during our worship service is confess our sins. We say out loud some version of, we are slaves to sin and cannot free ourselves. This part of our uh, confession is a direct quote from John as well, from his first letter, probably to the small church in, the, in Ephesus. And one of the last things that we do many Sundays during our worship service is receive the sacra sacrament of communion. And I recite the words of institution that this is done for the forgiveness of sins. In John's Gospel, Jesus reminds his listeners that everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. But if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. Now here's the thing though, even though we say these words and hear them before communion, sometimes we think we have to do it ourselves. Sometimes we think we have to earn forgiveness. 503 years ago, it certainly didn't seem easy to Martin Luther. Instead, there were a lot of rules about forgiveness. It seemed like nothing had changed. There were rules about how you had to, con how you had to confess your sins, rules about wh how you what you had to do afterward to get atonement. And all of these rules and obligations had Luther in a state of utter despair. How could he ever hope to achieve God's grace and forgiveness and mercy? And so he went back to scripture, and he began to realize that his despair was unfounded. Grace was possible because of the saving actions of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. We can be freed of all our sins through our faith in the truth of Jesus. So the rest they say is history. We have 500 years, 503 years ago now, the 95 Theses were pounded into a door. And it took a while, um, and instead of a true reformation, because that's what Luther had originally hoped, he really wanted to reform the church, but instead a new church was born. And it is so fitting that we affirm the baptism of our young people on Reformation Sunday because it all begins with baptism. Luther, in the small catechism, as I'm sure you will remember, reminds us of what baptism means for daily living. And this is a quote from the Catechism. It means that our sinful self, with all its evil deeds and desires, should be drowned through daily repentance, and that day after day, a new self should arise to live with God in righteousness and purity forever. Luther studied Romans, particularly Romans 6, and that reminds us today and every day that we are free from any baggage, any burden, of sin that we feel. We are free to walk in newness of life every day. But what does that freedom mean? Well, how do we live with that much freedom? What do we do with that much freedom? We talk a lot about freedom these days. For those of us who follow Christ, the Apostle Paul reminds us that while we are free, we cannot boast about it. It is not of our own doing. We are free from sin, of course, but that freedom opens us to a new freedom to love and serve our neighbor. Luther, um, in addition to all the other things he did, which sometimes is annoying, frankly, because he was younger than I am when he uh, died, um, Luther wrote an essay called The Freedom of a Christian just a few years after he pounded that nail into the cathedral door. And Luther's essay reminds us that as fully forgiven children of God, Christians are no longer bound to keep God's law to obtain salvation. However, we freely and willingly serve God and our neighbor. Luther wrote, a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Freedom means we are free from sin. Freedom means we are free to love our neighbor as ourselves. 
God's promises are renewed in us every day, and God's promises are renewed in our confirmants later today. In that newness, we are free, free of sin and free to show our love of God and our neighbor as the gifts have been given us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the freedom you bestowed on us with your death and resurrection, your sacrifice. Remind us every day that we are free of the burden of sin, free to love our neighbors as ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen. Worship continues with the Apostles' Creed found on the bottom of page three of your bulletin. We read together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the Church, the world, and all those in need. Renew and inspire the Church in the freedom of the Gospel, O God. Where the church is in error, reform it. Where the church speaks your truth, strengthen it. Where the church is divided, unify it. Bless our bishops, Elizabeth and Regina. Bless our partner congregations in Southeast Minnesota, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Colombia. And bless this congregation. Ignite in us the working of the Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the earth changes, as mountains shake and the waters roar, may we care for this planet as a holy habitation for all living things. Sustain all peoples and lands recovering from natural disasters of any kind, and especially folks fleeing fires and floods in the west and south. Bless our farmers and their families and all who receive sustenance from their work. Give them a fair price for their labor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide areas of the world divided or traumatized by conflict, especially in our own land. Free all from slavery and human trafficking, and protect all in harm's way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Release those living in bondage to debts, chronic pain, or addiction. Grant healing touch to those who are ill. And especially today, Lord, we ask for your healing touch for those in our community, our congregation, and our families who suffer in any way. Heather Gray, Marvin Peacock, Owen Hagen, Judy Robley, Tom Ellingson, Sue Alseth, Mary Amundsen, Lucas A.J. Wistey, Sharon Onstead Johnson, Betty Johnson, Vi Musser, Pat Blogsfed, Rachel Krensky, Shirley Gerard, Sandra Wenig, Mavis Johnsrud, Anna Bingham Yeris, Sawyer Oaks, Jennifer Wedman, all those affected by natural disasters, and all those suffering from COVID-19. And Lord, we ask your blessing in celebration of our confirmants affirming their faith today. For August Allen, Haley Ellingson, Allison Friedland, Caleb Griffin, Tyson Grindy, Hunter Holland, Maggie Lyle, Maddie Ostern, Nathan Solberg, Lydia Solom, and Ella Wenis. And we ask your prayers for all those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let us. 
pass the piece all the way over to Jackie. <laughs> and all of you at home, you can pass the piece in whatever way you um, are able. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had again given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, wherever we are, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we will do Holy Communion today just like we did it last week. I will come around with the individual cups and Pastor Lane will follow with the basket. If anybody's having trouble getting the, the, the top part off, he'll help you a little bit. Um, and so you can just stay where you are.
pray together the post-communion uh, prayer found on page five of your bulletin. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life, amen. Now life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the heart of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and may the blessing of Almighty God who made us, knows us, loves us, and journeys the way with us be with you now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Go forth from this place refreshed and empowered to do the ministry to which God calls you. Travel lightly, for you carry within you all that you need. Notice God's presence in simple, everyday experiences. Whenever opportunity arises, labor for the good of all. And the blessing and joy of God, our creator, healer, and life giver, be with you all. Thanks be to God.